Our speaker is, um, and I'm having all kinds of computer issues. Our speaker is Dr. Ashley Smith. Um, Ashley is an assistant professor in the Soil, Water, and Ecosystem Sciences Department at UF, and she's based in Homestead at the Tropical Education and Research Center. Dr. Smith is a biogeochemist who works in coastal and aquatic ecosystems. She combines aspects of coastal ecology and chemistry to understand how human activities impact the biogeochemical cycling of nutrients in a variety of environments. Her current research focuses on how nutrient pollution affects coastal ecosystem functions and how habitat restoration can improve water quality and water bodies. She not only does research, she's also an extension specialist, and she has two statewide extension programs, Climate, State, Climate Smart Floridians, which is designed to teach an individual what they can do to re reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions, and Eyes on Seagrass, a community science seagrass restoration or seagrass monitoring program. Before coming to UF and to Trek, um, Ashley had earned a BS and a PhD from the University of North Carolina. She also um, was a David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellow at the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences. She also did a postdoc at the University of Kansas. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and we're gonna hear from Ashley about bivalves. Great, thanks, Laura. Uh, I did try to get Laura to say go heels in my bio, but she quickly turned that down. So <laughs> I will sneak it in right now. I'm gonna share yeah, my is. screen. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that introduction and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm really excited to share some of the work that we've been doing since I've moved to the University of Florida, looking at the environmental be benefits of shellfish aquaculture specifically in terms of water quality. I'm sure that many of you are like me and you think of shellfish as being tasty treats for, for my stomach. Uh, but today we're gonna learn more about all the benefits that they have for our environment. The concept of using oysters and clams and other bivalves for nutrient management really gained a lot of momentum in the 2005, early 2000s, when a paper came out from Sweden where they looked at using a muscle installation instead of upgrading a wastewater treatment plant. Since then, we've had lots of advances in the Chesapeake Bay region where they've had a success in using shellfish for nitrogen removal services. And that ser service has actually been integrated into credit trading markets, although there have only been two trades. Uh, but the point remains, there is continued forward progress in using shellfish as an in-water strategy to help uh, meet nutrient reduction goals. And in fact, just early this year, the Chesapeake Bay Group released new guidelines that now allows credits for both aquaculture and oyster reef restoration. So it's just really exciting times. Today, I'm going to share the results of our project that uh, looking at shellfish aquaculture in the Gulf Coast of Florida, where we combine field-based measurements to uh, determine the capacity that shellfish aquaculture has to remove nutrients, and then combine this data with some economic surveys to figure out what the feasibility would be for a nutrient credit program in Florida. The focus of this project is really on shellfish aquaculture, both clams and oysters. And so today I'm going to cover justification for using shellfish for nutrient management, results from our shellfish nitrogen removal study, and then the assessment of ecosystem services and payments for services for Florida's shellfish aquaculture. And while the focus of our work is on shellfish for providing water quality benefits, I just want to, this they're not in any way meant to replace existing management strategies. And we'll come back to that as we go through my talk today. Before I begin, I just want to take a moment to say thank you to everybody who's been part of this project. It's an on very very extensive group of people from shellfish farmers in the Big Bend region and in Tampa Bay region to uh, interns and other, uh, other industry partners. The work I'll be covering is uh, funded by the Nature Conservancy through their TNC SOAR program. And we have a bunch of PIs and partners on this project. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of them before I dive into the talk. A lot of what I'll cover has been these people whose faces you see on the screen are really the boots on the ground or the hands in the lab to generate the, the data that, I will, uh, that I'm sharing. So thank you all for all of your efforts. And I know many of you are on the call today and I'm happy you're here. So when we think about shellfish, we think about our dinner plates. 
Uh, but before we can talk about shellfish and what they do for water quality, we have to take a step back and talk about what water quality is. When I think of water quality, I'm thinking mostly about nutrient pollution, specifically nitrogen pollution. Nutrient pollution is the process where too many nutrients enter coastal systems. Nitrogen is the nutrient of concern in coastal waters because it's the limiting nutrient for primary production. These nutrients can come from a variety of different sources. Some can occur naturally as the result of weathering from rocks and soils in the watershed. Some can actually come into estuaries and coastal zones just from the ocean and mixing. Uh, and then there's also nutrients that come in because of human related activities within the watershed. Because there's increasingly more people living in the coastal areas, there's more and more nutrients that enter our coastal zones. And these can be from waste or treatment plants, runoff from land and urban areas during rain, and even from farming. But when we get too many nutrients, that's when we start to see algal blooms. And that's when they describe this as turning the water guacamole colored green. A consequence of these algal blooms are then low dissolved oxygen events as the algae die and decompose, that process sucks out oxygen from the water column. And this results in these low oxygen zones or dead zones. That's when we end up with fish kills. Uh, we also have this algal growth in the water column and additional turbidity inputs that limit light availability to get to the sediments or to the benthos. And that leads to seagrass die-offs and overall reduction in habitat loss. Eutrophication resulting from nutrient pollution is a global problem. And 65% of estuaries within the United States have moderate to high impacts of uh, due to excess nutrients. So this is a real problem. And a lot of the times it's really difficult to control nutrients because they come from two different sources. There's point sources where you can point at and say, oh, that's a nutrient source. And then non-point sources, which integrate across the landscape. And those are much more difficult to control than those point sources. Now, if you're like me, it's a little bit tricky to think about nutrients as being bad, right? We need nutrients. They serve as the base of our cells and are essential for life. And so you can see here on the left side of the screen that that's a happy ecosystem. There's good water quality. You can see that lights getting to the bottom. There's some seagrass habitat. There's fish swimming, people, people swimming, and people fishing. But then when we get too many nutrients, we start to see all those negative consequences. We see that oxygen loss, we see those fish kills, and we see that uh, loss of all the other benthic habitats. And this would be our eutrophic system on our right. And this would be bad water quality. Like I don't wanna go swimming in a, that green colored water body. So nutrients, we need a little bit, but we can have too much of them. And this is really where shellfish come in. So right now, what we know is that land-based reductions of nutrients are not enough. We are still having nutrient pollution problems through many of our estuaries. We also know that wastewater treatment plants are re upgrades to treat and manage all of this new nitrogen and new nutrients that are entering in their systems and needing to be processed are costly and are not always the most efficient. And as I said, there's, it's also really difficult to control and to manage those non-point source pollutions. But we also know, and there's more and more literature coming out uh, that's highlighting the fact that shellfish filter water, we all know that, and they remove nitrogen. And it's because of this ability for shellfish to clean the water through filtration and to remove, uh, remove nitrogen, this pollutant, that there is this growing interest in using shellfish to meet water quality goals. I put together this figure to step through the ways that shellfish can help mitigate nutrient loads and control nutrient pollution. We have nitrogen that's entering the coastal system through atmospheric deposition, runoff, fertilizer, just for example. And that nitrogen is then fuels algae growth. The algae are grazed on by our little shellfish here, our little clams. And those clams repackage it. So the nitrogen that's in the algae is now repackaged into the biodeposits. This is just juicy organic matter for microbes. And the microbes chomp on all of that. This 
This nitrogen is now mineralized to ammonia, which is a bioavailable form of nitrogen. That nitrogen can flux out of the sediments and re, uh, re-enter the water column where it could be used by algae. Or if conditions are right, in the sediments, uh, that nitrate, that ammonium can be transformed into nitrate through the process of nitrification. That nitrate is also a bioavailable form of nitrogen that can flux out of the water col- uh, out of the sediments to the water column as well, and can be used for assimilation. But if there's enough organic matter around, the right microbial community is there, and there's a supply of nitrate and low oxygen, we can have the process of denitrification occur. Denitrification is nature's way to remove nitrogen. It takes that nitrogen that is that bioavailable form, that nitrate, and converts it into N2 gas. N2 gas is relatively biologically inert and uh, it's the majority of our atmosphere. So nitrogen is gas is where we want nitrogen. So this is how, it's these interactions that are how shellfish help to facilitate this nitrogen removal. The nitrogen comes in, it feeds the algae, the algae grow and bloom, the shellfish graze on that algae, repackage it, feed the microbes, and now the microbes chomp on it and transform it into N2 gas. It's not very direct, there's a lot of steps along the way, but eventually the shellfish are helping to mediate this removal of nitrogen. So overall then in our shellfish systems, we actually have a few different fates for nitrogen. The nitrogen can be denitrified, so in, converted into N2 gas. It can be mineralized or uh, that fluxing it back out into the water column. It can be assimilated both by algae or by the shellfish because they will also need some nitrogen to grow uh, or it could be buried in deeper in the sediment. But the pieces of the fates of nitrogen in shellfish systems that I think the most about because uh, in terms of mitigating nutrient loads are that assimilation into shellfish biomass, so that storage in shell and tissue, and then the increase in denitrification. But we have a little bit of a problem here. We have seen declining water quality, which has caused this loss of shellfish along with overfishing and disease. And then as we lose that shellfish, that means that we've lost their ability to filter the water. and other water quality benefits, as well as other services that they might provide. So now we have too few shellfish in our coastal systems and we have bad water quality, but we have this chance to increase shellfish into systems again to then restore water quality. In fact, this has been this growing interest in many coastal regions to restore shellfish. This, I love this cartoon. Oh my gosh, it's like 10 years old now. Uh, But it's from the Washington Post where nitrogen filtering oysters were the sunken treasure of Chesapeake Bay. If you know anything about Chesapeake Bay, you know that they have very bad water quality and are continuing to try to manage their nitrogen loads. And in this cartoon, I just think it's, here we have this, these oysters, they are really the gold. They're going to solve all of these problems. And it's this idea that's really led to groups around the United States to focus on restoring shellfish. In the Chesapeake Bay region, we have the Chesapeake Bay Oyster Alliance, which is 10 billion for the bay, uh, where it all adds up to clean water. In Long Island Sound, we have the Billion Oyster Project, again, with this idea of restoring oysters for their ecosystem services, including the water quality benefits. And then even more locally, we have rest, restoration underway in the Indian, uh, Indian River Lagoon for clams. In the Sarasota Bay, we have clam restoration again for more for water quality benefits and for habitat. Uh, uh, habitat. And then we have projects like, res- like the All Clams on Deck, restoring estuaries and growing coastal economies through shellfish. In fact, Florida, there's a lot of interest in Florida uh, in restoring clams and seagrasses in our estuaries for habitat and for water quality benefits. And just uh, last year, about $17.5 million was invested in restoring our estuaries and restoring water quality with shellfish. But restoration is expensive. In a paper we wrote a few, oh gosh, 
10 years ago, 11 years ago now, uh, we actually looked at the how much it costs to restore these, these habitats like oyster reefs. And we're looking at $52,000 to $260,000 per hectare. That's because a lot of uh, human power goes into restoring habitats. Uh, in the Nature Coast, you had the Lone Cabbage Oyster Reef Restoration, which cost more than $8 million. So restoration is not always that a feasible way to recover populations uh, because it is expensive. But there is, a, there is a way to increase shellfish biomass in an economic framework, and that's aquaculture. So aquaculture is growing organisms in, the, in, the, in water. Uh, and in terms of shellfish, they can, we grow shellfish for consumption later. But the shellfish that are growing in aquaculture are functioning the same way that we would, that shellfish do when you would restore them. So an oyster that's grown in aquaculture is still filter feeding, it's still pooping, uh, it's still cleaning water. So you're getting a lot of each, uh, the same uh, functions that you do from a restored reef. You might not be getting some of the reef structural benefits, but from a water quality perspective, it's adding shellfish, shellfish that filter feed back into the environment. So there's a lot of positive benefits of shellfish aquaculture. And these benefits are actually not captured though in the price of the shellfish. And so these are these ecosystem services or the benefits that humans get from nature. And it's these ideas that have really motivated the projects that I work on and what I'll talk to you all about today. Shellfish are a marketed good. People want shellfish. The oyster on the half shell is a hot commodity. I mean, at the last restaurant I went to, it was like $5 for an oyster, which just seemed insane to me. Uh, and we know that there's this, uh, we wanna have improved water quality or environmental qual quality in general, and that we're getting this as a byproduct of the production from shellfish aquaculture. We're also motivated by understanding the mechanisms that exist to increase the benefits from uh, from shellfish aquaculture and benefits that we can give the industry. Because if these little guys are out there filtering and doing great stuff for us, is there some way to support our industry partners? These questions kind of come down, that question comes down to two sub focuses that are really relevant right now in our state. And this is growing interest in restoration aquaculture. Restoration aquaculture is growing plants and animals for ecosystem services. Uh, including that water quality improvement. So it's exclusively growing animals, oysters, clams, seagrasses in some cases uh, for, for those benefits. And then we also have this growing interest in uh, nutrient offset markets or credit markets. And this is when you have a regulated point source. So somebody you can point to that's a nitrogen polluter and they can pay for actions to, uh, to offset their nutrient pollution. This is like, this is just really exciting here in the state of Florida. Uh, right now, we, we have growing interest in shellfish aquaculture. We're one of the fifth largest state for shellfish aquaculture, and we have a lot of water quality problems. I might be the only person who's excited about that. Uh, but we currently lack the regulatory framework to compensate growers for the environmental benefits that shellfish provide. And we don't have the ability to incentivize shellfish farmers then to produce enough product for these restoration activities. Because ultimately, shellfish is a marketed good. And that's where these growers are going to get the biggest return on their investment for. So this is the motivation for our project. And for we've focused then on identifying two key questions. The first is related to nitrogen removal. We wanted to know if shellfish aquaculture in Florida actually removed nitrogen. When we looked through the literature, uh, what we found was that many studies that prove or show that shellfish are removing nitrogen are from the uh, New England or from the Mid-Atlantic, but data were noticeably absent from Florida. Moreover, the majority of work that has been done around shellfish for water quality is focused on oysters and not on clams. And we all know clams are king in Florida. So our first question was to figure out how much nitrogen is removed from shellfish aquaculture. In doing that, then we can use that information to evaluate the impact of aquaculture on Florida's water quality goals. 
The second question we were addressing was related to payments for ecosystem services, where we wanted to look at how much these credits could be. So to do this, the first thing we needed to do was find different sites to go sample. Our goal for this was to find areas where there were active shellfish leases, both oysters and clams, uh, where they were located in areas where there was nutrient problems, because these would be where those buyers for those potential credits would be, and that it was located within six hours of Homestead, where my lab is, because once we collect our samples, we have to bring them back to the lab really quickly to start our denitrification experiments. And when we put these together, we end, we end up finding a few, few good locations, the first being the Tampa Bay region and the second being Cedar Key. So what we would do is we would go out and we collect samples. We were collecting sediment samples where denitrification is going to occur from under clam aquaculture, under oyster aquaculture, uh, in and around. We were getting our hands in there at both of these, and Tampa Bay and the Cedar Key region. Uh, we did this both in the wet and the dry season. And then we also found areas that could have product on it, but didn't. And we considered those our reference or our control sites. Oh, and sometimes we would even sample macroalgae that was covering the bags, because this is actually another nitrogen sink that I really hope we get to explore more of. But here are our results. This has been work that's been led by Gabby Forsa, who works in my lab as a technician. She's really been the driving force behind running all these samples. And so what we're getting here is these net N2 fluxes. This is our denitrification rate. A positive flux means that denitrification is happening. Our yellow bar, or orange bars are the shellfish farms, and you have our clams and then our oysters. And then we have the blue bars, which are the reference. So those are the sites that don't have any shellfish. Uh, and we have our Southwest Florida region and our Big Bend region. So I look at this data right away and there's a few things that speak to me. Number one, I'm excited to see that all of our bars are positive. That means that every all of our sediments are net denitrifying and nobody is making new nitrogen. No one's fixing nitrogen. So in each instance, we have net denitrification. But what I also see is that there is a lot of variability uh, between all of our, at all of our sites. And I should say that this does, uh, this is the average over both the wet and the dry season. What I also see, what stands out to me, is the big difference between the sites, where at our Southwest Florida or Tampa site, we see this, uh, there is the increase with the shellfish farm. While at the Big Bend region, we don't see that. In fact, we see a little bit of a decrease with the shellfish present, although not different. And so these data collectively make me think that we need site-specific data. It's not gonna be a one-size-fits-all approach. There's variation in local hydrology, sediment types, number of farms, age of farms, that all might affect the uh, magnitude or this enhancement in denitrification that's due to the shellfish presence. And it also highlights the importance of shellfish biomass and the fate of biodeposits, which I'll talk a little bit more about right now. What I mean by that is the fact that there is a lot of high density aquaculture on the Big Bend and in Cedar Key. So we don't see this difference, this enhancement uh, with the, in denitrification with the shellfish in that region, right? So if we think about Cedar Key, this is a map of all the available leases. There's none. They're high density aquaculture. They're packed together in these aquaculture use zones and everything is green, meaning everything is occupied. This is in contrast to what we see in the Tampa Bay region where there's just a few little sites. Uh, there are not nearly as many leases that are available or open. And you also have a different, uh, different hydrology here. So, this a number of shellfish farms might be one reason that we see differences in denitrification rates. And the number of shellfish farms relates to the number of shellfish that are there. And so this is a, a figure from a Newell paper a while ago where they postulated that the relative density or the amount of oysters in this case are all shellfish relates to the denitrification services. So as you get more and more shellfish, you end up having less and less denitrification enhancement. And that's because you might not be, the sediments might be all accumulated with so much organic matter that you just can't really distinguish anymore between the reference site and the shellfish site. 
And that the footprint of aquaculture is just so expansive when you have all of these shellfish there pooping and peeing and doing their thing. So how does these data, how do these data compare then to what we see in other states? Well, some of our work from Cherry Stone Aqua Farms on the Eastern shore of Virginia, which is the largest producer of clams, um, shows that we found enhanced but limited denitrification there at an oyster farm. And that for our clam farms, we didn't always see that enhancement in denitrification. So this, what we see from Cedar Key and from Tampa Bay are both fitting in with what the literature is saying for more of these uh, clam studies and these more high, high density areas. In Smith Island, Virginia, uh, where we looked at clams and oysters, we didn't, we saw enhanced denitrification for both the clams and the oysters, but we didn't see any seasonal effects for clam aquaculture, which is also what we didn't, we saw in our study here in Cedar Key. So, uh, and the magnitude of most of our increases or no effects were similar between the different, like, uh, different study sites. So Cedar Key is on par with some of the other results that we're coming, uh, we're seeing about aquaculture. And Tampa Bay is, with their limited uh, number of shellfish farms, might be trending more to what we're seeing in other locations where we are seeing this effect of shellfish. But one of the best parts about aquaculture is that denitrification is not the only way to remove nitrogen. In fact, we also have that nitrogen removal through assimilation at harvest. So when that shellfish is actually extracted from the environment, all that nitrogen in the shell and tissue come with it. So Shirley Baker has been leading this work to look at the amount of nitrogen that is contained in shellfish uh, at different size classes and at different kinds. So for oysters, we have diploids and triploids. Uh, and then in clams, we have different size classes. And she's been doing this around the state to look at all, at the, see how location matters. But this would mean that when you harvest these shellfish, this is how much nitrogen is, is uh, you can extract from the environment through that. What we see here is that there is variability in size, which makes sense. Smaller shellfish probably contain more nitrogen, uh, but that the site differences have been less apparent from some of our work, but well, we're still waiting for our final data to come through. This puts us with, what I think is happening here is that since the majority of the clam aquaculture is in the Big Bend, they would end up getting more benefit from nitrogen removal at harvest. And since there's limited opportunities for expansion, there might also be limited interest in a payments for ecosystem services because they couldn't just have their shellfish there, or they, there might not be space to just have shellfish there just for water quality benefits. While in Southwest Florida, where our shellfish farmers have had historically had periods of long closures due to red tide, uh, they, when there are not as many shellfish farms, there might be more interest in getting nitrogen removal through enhanced denitrification. Uh, and there might be more of an interest in using, uh, getting credits for the nitrogen removal then. And this is particularly important then in Tampa because there's the Tampa Bay region because it's a water body with a long history of nitrogen pollution problems and uh, a lot of focused management strategies related to mitigating nitrogen pollution. So in the Big Bend region, we're gonna get most nitrogen removal through harvest. Tampa, we're gonna get most nitrogen removal through denitrification. And I think that the potential for credits would be of more interest to shellfish farmers in Southwest Florida than maybe shellfish farmers in the Big Bend because they have a, they're a larger portion of the market and are able to sell their product and they might not need then a credit or a payment for their services. So the next question we wanted to know then, well, how much would these credits even be if there was any type of credit in Florida? And this is work that's being led by Kelly Grogan in the uh, Food Resources and Economics Department at UF. So what Kelly and her team have been doing is really figuring out if uh, what credits would cost. So she's led some surveys looking at the supply side. So this would be our growers to determine what they would need, how much they would need to be paid just to grow shellfish for water quality. And then she's been doing surveys on the demand side. So wastewater treatment plants and how much they would be willing to pay for credits if they can't meet their, their nitrogen goals. 
So some results from the, her surveys, the first is the credit or the credit supply, the shellfish uh, producers. The survey was sent to 359 clam and oyster producers and we got 59 responses. So thank you to all of those who did respond. Uh, and the survey is kind of what you would expect. Um, the majority of people are male. Uh, there's more clams produced than oysters. And the people who are in the industry tend to be in the industry for a longer period of time. These were the people who then answered the following our questions about growing shellfish just for nutrient removal benefits. And then we asked them a question about, would you be willing to grow shellfish in closed waters? Uh, this would mean that you could only grow shellfish for ecosystem services. You could not grow those shellfish for harvest. So you're eliminating that revenue stream. This is particularly important right now as restoration aquaculture is growing in the state. And we even have FDACs offering restoration aquaculture leases, which are specifically for, uh, for not for consumption, for in environmental benefits. And so while the majority of people thought that they needed more information because they weren't really sure, which is fair, it's still a new, uh, new line of research and a uh, new, new lease agreement, we did have five that said definitely yes, some that said maybe, six that said definitely not. So it, it would be a lot harder. It's a lot harder to spend your energy and to grow your products if you're not gonna, if you don't know that you can sell it. But there's interest, which is encouraging. The next question that we asked everybody was then, what was the price that you would need to be paid if you were just growing your shellfish for nitrogen removal benefits? So this would determine the price that the grower is willing to sell their credits at. So in the first column, you have the current price that they're offering. And then I highlighted the co second column, I guess third, uh, which is the, the sale is never allowed. So this would be when you are growing those shellfish just in closed water, just for water quality benefits. And you can see that the, the prices that they would need are 18 cents is the highest one to three cents. So they range, uh, this is per an individual, but you, it's clear you would need a little bit more money per individual if you are not going to sell that because you're still spending all of the energy to tend to that lease, to keep those animals alive, to keep them growing, to keep them filtering. We also surveyed our waste for our treatment plants to determine the cost of the credits or to determine the demand for credits and how much they would be willing to pay for them. Because we, we have our farmers and our shellfish that are filtering nutrients, removing nitrogen, and uh, they can, they're doing that. But if there's no demand for it, then who would buy those credits? So we surveyed 50 waste for treatment plants. Uh, 20 out of the 55 facilities represented areas in basin management action plans. So that means they have a nutrient pollution problems and 30 out of 55 actually have a uh, national pollution discharge elimination system permits. So they have regulated the amount of nutrients that they're allowed to discharge. So our first question was then how concerned are they about meeting the, uh, meeting the continued demand as population grows and then upgrading their treatment, their treatment facilities along the way. In the next 10 years, people were not very, not very concerned. In the next 20 years, still not very concerned. Some are shifting more towards concerned. And then the next 30 years, we have more very concerned. This question is important because the cost to upgrade services is expensive. And so figuring out if there's any worry about this to then sort of guide whether or not they would be more willing to enter into a nutrient trading credit market. We then asked uh, if there was what they would be willing to pay for those nitrogen credits. We focused this question specifically on the waste for treatment plants that were emitting or discharging more than three milligrams per liter of nitrogen uh, because that's the limit for in the state of Florida. And so these questions were then specifically about what would this buyer be willing to pay for the nitrogen credits? And what we have is the minimum would be 91 cents 
uh, with the maximum being $10 per kilogram of nitrogen removed. So this means that the potential payment to a farmer would range from 0.9, uh, from 91 cents per kilogram to $10 per kilogram. And now remember, there's not many kilograms per an oyster or a clam. So they would need a lot of shellfish to be able to meet this kilogram goal. But what we wanted to do then was to, we wanted to combine this information to really figure out how much nitrogen removal is worth. So we, were, we wanted to combine all the information that we had using the total annual nitrogen removal from our shellfish farm, uh, both for denitrification and assimilation, and then figure out our uh, total removal potential. So we have our denitrification enhancement. So again, how much nitrogen is removed through denitrification above background? And then we took our numbers that we were getting from our study and upscaled them based on year, to make them a year based on daily light conditions and the footprint, the area of that lease. And then we can combine those data with harvest data, uh, which would be based on the nitrogen content of that individual and then scaled based on harvest sales. And this would get a shellfish farmer the total amount of nitrogen removed from their farm per year. And we can get these and then kilograms of nitrogen, which is what the, the waste for treatment plants need their numbers in. And so I've done this uh, illustration here based on the assumption of a sale of two, 250 individuals and that the size of the lease area would be about two acres. So we have our nitrogen removal for extraction and our denitrification, enhanced denitrification numbers. For our oysters, we are moving 0.12 grams per individual. Uh, and then for our denitrification, we're getting 9.74 grams of nitrogen removed per acre per day. Clams, 0 0.07 uh, grams per individual. So again, these are small numbers and then 43.2 grams per acre per a day. This, so if we add these up, this would mean that our oysters are removing 37 uh, kilograms per year of nitrogen and that the clam farm is removing 49 kilograms per year of nitrogen. So this is the value that you would then use to compare to input nutrient targets within the system or in the water body or then be used for that payments for ecosystem services. So if this was our hypothetical farm, what we end up finding is that this shellfish farm could remove about 190 pounds of nitrogen or 23 50 pound bags of lawn fertilizer. And this would be just a drop in the hat for what the waste water treatment plant actually means. But if this was then traded in a credit trading market and there was a potential buyer for these, this could result in an additional payment for, uh, to the shellfish farmer of $78 to almost $900. And this would then be the ecosystem services benefits that shellfish farms would provide. So ultimately, I think all of this work comes down to this idea that shellfish aquaculture and the environment is a win-win-win. It's a win for the environment because they're filtering they're growing. It's a win for economies because it is a product. And it's a win for me because I like to eat them. But we still have some challenges and that the payments for ecosystem services might not be the most straightforward approach and might real and still need some development. Collectively, our questions were focused on addressing how much nitrogen does bivalve aquaculture remove. And the answer is it depends. We still need more data. I know that's the most unexciting answer, but we still need more data. Uh, <laughs> what our results show is that species matters, location matters, the type of culture you're using, whether you're using for oysters, whether you're using floating cages or on bottom cages can matter. Uh, the density seems to be something that's coming out as one of these key drivers of some of the denitrification numbers that we're seeing. It completely relates to the total nitrogen removal that you're getting through harvest. And that the location does matter. There's factors like hydrology that uh, we didn't measure in our study, but Cedar Key and Tampa Bay are quite different. But what I think is also important to remember is that nitrogen removal is just one service that shellfish can provide. And having shellfish in the environment can provide additional benefits too, including water clarity, so they can help uh, seagrasses grow. 
And then what is the real feasibility of having nutrient credits for bivalve aquaculture? Is it really possible? Maybe. The scale of removal by shellfish relative to the demand that the waste water treatment plant would need is, is a mismatch. And that's one of the primary issues. So right now the waste water treatment plants wouldn't even enter into a trading agreement with an aquaculture a grower because they're looking for like a lot, a lot, a lot more nitrogen removal than what these growers can provide. So right now there is no, there wouldn't, there's no interest in these credits. Be, and instead the waste water treatment plant, for example, would go to like a wetland restoration where they could get many more credits for their, their value. As some of these permits come into play and, and TMDLs might total maximum daily loads and nutrient management might be going into effect, then there's a chance that they might need to top off a little bit more to meet their nitrogen goals. And that's when the potential for shellfish I think is, is greatest. Uh, what was also interesting is that there's many, many reasons not to participate both from the grower and the seller side. Uh, aside from the mismatch in willingness to pay versus like the amount of credits they would need uh, and how much they'd be willing to accept credits, uh, issues with the amount of paperwork that might have to go into that uh, came up throughout our surveys and just the time commitments that you would have to uh, participate in these credit agreements. So ultimately, I think that shellfish are a tool in our toolbox for nitrogen removal and shellfish aquaculture has a lot of promise, but there's really a lot of ongoing questions that limit credits for payments for ecosystem services. And when we think about restoration aquaculture, there, we have to think of other ways to support the industry uh, when they are not able to harvest their product. But all of this comes back to this idea that we are developing tools to help nutrients, to help manage and reduce nutrients. And that these are not, not in any way meant to replace existing management strategies. And if we really wanna to get to solutions for nutrient pollution, we need to go inland and think about land-based management. Shellfish are, are there, they're helping us. They're an in-water strategy but they're just part of the solution, not going to be the, they're not gonna be the sunken treasure to save Chesapeake Bay or to save any of Florida's water bodies. So with that, thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ashley. Um, folks are probably working on their poll just a little bit, but you are welcome to type questions into the chat. Um, you're also welcome to um, turn your video on and ask Ashley questions directly. There's actually one question that's already been put into the into the chat, and Morgan asked, were there differences in ambient nitrogen between Tampa Bay and Cedar Key? That's a great question, Morgan. Uh, and I did not plant that, I promise. Um, <laughs> yes, there were differences between the ambient concentrations. And actually, there were higher nitrate concentrations in Cedar Key than in Tampa. But when we just take these point measurements, you know, we're just going out and taking these discrete sampling events. The fact that there is no nitrogen means that there's probably been used already. So if we're not finding it in the water, it means something else could be using it. So it doesn't actually reflect like what's what's there. Um, can I follow up to that? Sorry. So if you're thinking about water management uh, and designating water bodies as being like polluted or not, uh, we FDP actually uses chlorophyll as an indicator for nutrients because when you get more chlorophyll, it means that there's more nutrients. So you could see a lot of chlorophyll, but you might not see that in the nutrient signature because the chlorophyll, the algae have used it all. Thanks, Vanilla. Um, if you want to unmute, you can ask a question. Over here. Hi. Um, awesome talk, Ashley. Um, I had a question, um, and hopefully I can articulate it right, but in terms of when there's a lot of um, like algae in the water because of anthropogenic activities, there might also be maybe more um, pollutants like toxic chemicals that um, bioaccumulate in bivalves. And I just was wondering if you um, have considered any of those bioaccumulations in terms of using these bivalves as kind of mitigators for water quality. Yeah, that's a great question. So I should start by saying that if you're going to eat shellfish, they are safe to eat. 
shellfish that end up on our plates have all come from opened waters or they have been where they have been approved to grow shellfish and it's a heavily regulated industry. So in no instance, like you should not have to worry about heavy metals in your shellfish that you're eating. Uh, where this comes into play is in this idea that if we're using shell, we have not looked specifically at using shellfish for remediating uh, heavy metals or some of these other factors. And we haven't looked at them in any of our data. But where I think that this comes into play is if you're going to get these restoration leases that are in closed areas, that water is probably closed for, I don't know, heavy metals <laughs> or fecal indicator bacteria or something like that. So they might serve this purpose there. And then is there any way to, what do you do with that now? Could you clean that off or polish that off later? Relay it as a term. And you can't do that in the state of Florida. Uh, so yeah, the question of like, are they efficient at doing that? But then what do we do with it? It still remains to be seen. Cool, thanks. I, I can ask a question. Um, well, uh, Okay, some more coming up, but I'm going to ask really quickly anyway. Um, there are a lot of natural um, natural habitats, natural organisms that can remove nitrogen. Like how how does shellfish compare to some of those others, like marshes or seagrasses or mangroves? Well, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, denitrification happens naturally whenever conditions are right. They have to have supply of well, the microbes have to be there, number one, but then there has to be uh, carbon supply, nitrate supply, and low oxygen. So some of our work has compared all these different habitats, all these structural habitats, and seagrasses might win. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, so seagrasses do a, a really good at denitrification too in some of the studies we've looked at. And then some of the new work that we're doing in our lab is exploring the idea of co-restoration. So if you were to restore two habitats that both have denitrification, are you going to maximize those benefits? Or is there some sort of um, competition where you might get, it might be functionally redundant and use that denitrification service decrease? Uh, I don't have comparisons for Florida, but in North Carolina, seagrass is kind of. Yay, seagrass. <laughs> We do have another question in the in the chat. Um, do you have any idea how the incremental removal of nitrogen resulting from aquaculture of shellfish, shellfish compares to that of recreational harvest of scallops? Um, they're yummy too. They are yummy. Uh, I don't have any data on that. I I would imagine that the nitrogen removal from shellfish would be a lot larger just based on from harvest just based on the number of shellfish that are being harvested throughout the state. I don't think that the recreational scallop industry compares on that scale. I think scallops are so fun because they, they swim. I would just, <laughs> they do not fit in my course for denitrification. They're too active. Maybe you should develop some new cores. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions for Ashley? Alex asks, do you know how ocean acidification might impact shellfish ability to remove nitrogen? No, so ocean acidification has been uh, linked to, it hinders the growth of the shellfish. So if shellfish are not growing as much or their shells might be even softer, so they might be using energy differently and maybe not filtering as much, then that would all trickle down to their ability to enhance denitrification because it could affect their the quality and amount of biodeposit production, which would then affect how much is being transferred to the uh, to the microbes to then denitrify. Anyone else? All right, I think we're almost out of time anyway. Um, thank you, Ashley, for, for coming. Thank you for sharing your talk. Thank you, everyone, for um, um, joining in on some nice conversation afterwards. And we hope to see you back in the new year. Mm -hmm.